into the future. So the, where OAuth started, where, where OAuth 2 started rather, is with this core document. So RFC 6749 is considered the sort of starting point of, of OAuth. That's what you'll start reading when you start finding and looking into these specs. This core document describes essentially a couple of different ways to get access tokens. So it's going to be things like um, these different OAuth flows. So the authorization code flow, the implicit flow. Um, and these describe various ways that apps can get an access token. Now, the access token is the thing the app is going to use to go make an API request. What's uh, What sort of happened when this was coming out was uh, the way that access tokens a lot of the frustrations people had around OAuth 1 were in dealing with how to use those access tokens. It required a lot of cryptographic signing in your application code, which made it pretty hard to actually to actually work, uh, use on a regular basis and in lots of different environments. So that one of the things that OAuth 2 did was simplify that into what we call bearer tokens. And the idea with a bearer token is that it is all that is required in order to make an API request. Basically, it's called a bearer token because whoever is holding the token can use it to make an API request. Now, that does mean it's higher risk than using something like signed requests because if you steal a token, it can be used to make an API request as well. And there's no indication that it will have been stolen. So this was something that was, I would say, hotly debated around the time that OAuth was first created. and uh, OAuth 2 was was first created. And because it was debated so much, it actually ended up getting split out into a separate RFC. So bearer tokens are their own RFC because not everybody actually agreed that this was a good way to do it. However, it is, in fact, the way that most things continue to work today because it is so much simpler than any other method. And we'll get to more of that in a little bit. Um, this RFC about bearer tokens describes a few different ways of using bearer tokens, things like using it in an HTTP header or using it in the, po the um, post body of a, of a post request, also using it in a query string, which uh, one of these is a bad idea, it turns out. So this is sort of the origins of OAuth 2. And then when it was created, mobile apps and single page apps were still actually relatively new ideas, and there wasn't a lot of maturity in those platforms. So one of the, but, but they were, they did exist, obviously, this is 2012, so this is several years after the iPhone uh, was first announced. And one of the goals of OAuth 2 was actually to have it be possible to use in these kinds of environments where OAuth 1 really wasn't possible. So some of the, the, the flows in OAuth 2 were created specifically for this purpose of being able to work in JavaScript apps, single page apps, and also mobile apps. But even then, uh, so the implicit flow was one of those. And even then, the implicit flow was known that it was not the most secure option. It's just that it was sort of the only way to do it at the time. So these, these apps, these you know, single page apps and mobile apps, they have this particular problem where they can't actually use a client secret to protect uh, any requests that are made to the authorization server, for example. And a client secret authenticates the app in a way that um, you know, without it, you kind of never are really sure who's making the request, which app's making the request. So the implicit flow and the, um, and the alternative of the authorization code flow, just not using a client secret, those have a problem, which is that nothing's ever really sure that, this, that the flow actually was successful. I like to use this, this picture of um, sending data in, in the front channel, which is how the implicit flow works uh, and how the authorization code flow returns that temporary authorization code. I like to imagine that it's kind of like throwing it over the wall, over a wall, where if you're throwing this, this either access token in the implicit flow or authorization code over a wall, you can't actually see if it's been received. And there's a similar problem on the other side. You can't actually tell where it's coming from. All you see is that something came over the wall. You can't tell if it's from who you actually think it's from. So this is just a fact that this is a problem with using, with sending data in this manner. So we have to work around that problem in various ways. So one of the ways to solve this is by using this extension called Pixie. So a few years after OAuth 2 was first published, Pixie was, was developed uh, specifically for mobile apps to be able to use the authorization code flow when they can't use a client secret. 
So Pixie solves this problem of sending data over the front channel by essentially creating a new secret per request on the fly. And I'm not going to go into the details of how it works here, but I do have videos on YouTube on the Okta developer channel uh, that talk more about this in detail if you're curious. So after the Pixie was developed, there was another RFC published, which was specific recommendations for doing OAuth in mobile apps. And one of those, one of those recommendations is, of course, that, that mobile apps should use Pixie. And there's some other recommendations in there as well. So Pixie was created for mobile apps, but it's actually useful for any time that there's no client secret, which means single page apps can also use it now. And this is actually one of the specs I'm working on, which is recommendations for browser-based apps. And one of those, one of the recommendations in this spec is saying that browser-based apps or single page apps should also use Pixie because it solves, it, they have the same problem that mobile apps have. So why wasn't this a recommendation sooner? Well, what do these two browsers have in common? These browsers do not support cores, cross-origin resource sharing. Why is that important? Well, if you are writing a single page app, it's probably served on the app's domain and your token endpoint, the thing that's issuing access tokens, your OAuth server, very well might be on a different domain. And if it is, then you have to have uh, cross-origin resource sharing set up properly in order to actually make that API request across domains. Now, this is like obviously a widely supported thing now. Single page apps use this all the time for accessing various APIs, and it's very normal. And it's very widely supported, of course, because it's just such a normal part of the modern web. So because it's available, it actually now makes sense to use it in OAuth as well. So with uh, cross-origin resource sharing, now browser-based apps, single page apps can use Pixie, which means the implicit flow is basically no longer useful. And that was the only sort of remaining use of the implicit flow. And it was never a good idea to begin with. Everybody knew that. So let's now, you know, officially take it out, right? So one of the recommendations, again, in the browser-based app spec is to avoid the implicit flow. It is, you know, not useful anymore. There's a couple other things the spec says, which is various options you have for configuring um, your single page app, whether that's the single page app itself, being the OAuth client and getting access tokens and making API requests directly, or putting it behind a application server, sort of a backend for the front end pattern and using a HTTP only cookie between the browser and that application server. And these are the kinds of things that are going into this document. So then there's another document, which is the security best current practice. And this is an in progress one still, it's not finalized. And this document basically encapsulates these recommendations and several others into this, this document that it describes sort of the most secure way to do things now. And one of the things that also does is takes out the password grant, because again, that was never really the intention of, of it. But it also recommends using Pixie even for confidential clients, because it also it's not just that um, mobile apps can't use a client secret. There's this other problem of authorization code injection, which is a potential issue. And um, that's again, way, would take way too long to describe in this talk, but I do have several videos again on YouTube talking about it. Um, and it also says, well, okay, you know, passing access tokens and query strings was never a good idea either. Let's take that out. So the security BCP is basically trying to say, we know that there were some things in the original spec that weren't really a good idea, but they were sort of in there for some reason or another. Let's now officially take them out. So I want to talk about the password grant for a minute because this is actually a really important one. The security BCP is flat out taking this out. It's saying, just don't use a password grant. And you might be thinking, well, that seems awkward. How am I supposed to then like, you know, use, use OAuth or in a, in a single page app or in a mobile app or something? Well, the password grant was never meant for how it's ended up being used. It's actually there because it was meant to be an upgrade path for apps that weren't doing OAuth and just storing passwords and using passwords at APIs, which is a horrible idea. And you know, it is now uh, it, it was intended to be an upgrade path to to trade those passwords in for access tokens. So it was a migration plan. And that's not how it ended up being used. Um, if you are curious, though, passwords are a bad idea to to let apps hold passwords because it's you know exposing that password to the application, which even for first party or trusted apps is a risk. And it also trains users that it's okay to enter their password in random places, which is again, not great. It's also impossible or 
difficult at best to extend this to support multi-factor auth or passwordless authentication. So it's really just not very flexible. It was never meant to, to be in there in the first place, really. So let's take it out. All right, so the security BCP is sort of the capturing the state of the art of what is the current best practice in OAuth. Basically, it says all OAuth clients must use Pixie with the authorization code flow. So no more implicit flow. Password grant, no more. Um, redirect URLs, they have to be exact match instead of sort of wildcard matching. There's some really tricky ways those can go wrong otherwise. Um, don't pass in access tokens and query strings anymore. And refresh tokens for public apps have to actually be uh, either sender constrained, which means adding some sort of key into it, or one-time use. Okay, but I will also caveat this. This is still in progress, this is not finalized. You can go to this link on the, in the slides to learn more details and also join in all the discussion. So that's sort of where we get to right now, which is, I would say, state-of-the-art, current um, best understand, understood recommendations for, doing, for, for building OAuth systems. There's a lot of in-progress work as well. And I want to just sort of give you a quick summary of a lot of the sort of current, current in-progress work. Um, JSON Web Tokens for access tokens. Many systems actually use JSON Web Tokens as access tokens. So there's a new document which describes if you are going to use JSON Web Tokens as access tokens, here's some recommendations for you. And it describes particular claims that go into it, particular ways of handling it, things like that. So it'll describe these keys and, and what these values are supposed to be and how to use them. Um, so that way, if you do have, if you do want to use JSON Web Tokens as access tokens, you now have a pattern to follow to do it securely. Uh, there's another one that is um, called demonstration of proof of possession. And this one is basically a way to create sender constrained access tokens, but not doing it at the transport layer. So mutual TLS is another option where you kind of do it at the TLS layer. This is a way of doing it in your application layer. So you can see that there'll be like an extra header added to an API request, which is uh, a way to sign this request with some key so that it's then associated with the access token that you get. Um, there's a couple of new extensions that are coming into the, into the group for the first time being discussed about. And these open up some really cool possibilities for interesting ways to, um, interesting new UIs or new things that can be done. So rich authorization requests. There's this problem with OAuth scope, which is that it's actually pretty limited in what it can describe. Scope is, of course, how you would say, grant this application read-only access versus write access or access to your files in Google Drive. But that's actually pretty limited. It can't describe like fine-grained or, um, or detailed requests. So you might want to describe a request like this. This application would like to pay this merchant $123.50 from your account ending in blah, right? And then you want to authorize this one request. You don't want to grant this app permission to always pay this merchant arbitrary amounts. You want to say, I'm granting this specific request. So rich authorization request describes a syntax for actually describing the request the app is trying to make so that the authorization server can um, display that in a user interface. Push authorization requests is solving um, another problem, which is that the front channel is, it's basically reducing reliance on the front channel. So normally when you start an OAuth flow, you build up a URL and then redirect the browser to that. That has the problem that um, things, you know, the user or other applications could modify that request that the app is making. So push authorization request instead initiates that request from the back channel. So instead of the URL that you would normally be building up to start the OAuth flow at the top, you instead first push that to the OAuth server, you get back a request URL, and then you redirect them to that URL so that the user can't modify what's in that request. I think that's a really, I'm excited for this one because it's a lot more secure and it's not that much extra work to actually build. Uh, JSON Web Token Authorization re Requests, or JAR, this is the idea of, um, it, it's again, a way to protect the request the app is making, but it's doing this in a way that also signs it so that the authorization server can actually prove the client made this request. So you would take those request parameters again and then put them into a JSON web token and then sign it and package that up. That can then either be passed by URL because it then can't be tampered with, or it could be pushed using push authorization requests. So at this point, okay, you're probably thinking, that's a lot. And there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of different RFCs. And you're you're right. Like it is a lot. It can feel like trying to get through a maze in order to actually find your way through this and figure out what you need to know and 
and where those things are. So one of the other initiatives in the group that I'm leading is actually to sort of consolidate a lot of these. So if we take a look at sort of what is the current widely regarded stable parts of OAuth 2, it's this picture, right? We've started with OAuth core, we've taken some things out, we've added some things, we've taken out some things of bearer tokens. And if you look at what's actually left, it's actually a lot simpler. It's actually a few grants and a few different ways of using tokens. And this is what we're trying to wrap up in this bundle called OAuth 2.1. So OAuth 2.1 is an attempt to sort of reset the baseline so that as a new as a newcomer, instead of starting from you know the uh, documents from 2012 and reading all the way through till now, you're starting at sort of what's currently regarded as widely established and can then find the extensions you need after after that from there. So OAuth 2.1 is an attempt to consolidate the OAuth 2 specs, adding best practices, removing deprecated features capturing the best practices in OAuth under a single name, and also adding references to things that didn't exist when OAuth was first written. If you look at the original OAuth 2 document, there's a lot of places in there where it says, this is future work, we don't have a good solution for this yet, and now we do, we have a lot of these extensions. So it's, you know, now we can incorporate those and sort of guide people in the right direction to find the, the new work that actually is uh, working well. Some things that are not goals of OAuth 2.1, there is, it's explicitly not supposed to define new behaviors. So it's supposed to be just capturing existing behavior in a new in a new spec. It's also not going to include anything that's experimental or in progress or not widely implemented. So the sort of summary of what's in it is um, OAuth 2 core, bearer tokens, Pixie, the native app and browser-based app best current practices, and the security best current practice. This, you can find more information at oauth.net slash 2.1. There's also, this is the link to the actual draft itself. And that is sort of where we're at with OAuth 2. The last thing I wanna talk about is what's next. So you might have heard some, some mumblings about OAuth 3, and um, there is a new effort led by a very similar group of people, but under a different group which is to sort of, again, redefine everything. So there's two different proposals right now. There's a lot of discussions going on in this group. It's actually a new IETF working group. It's not being done in the OAuth working group, and it is explicitly not backwards compatible with OAuth 2. So OAuth 3 is meant to sort of do what OAuth 2 did for OAuth 1, which is throw out all the old stuff, take the parts that were good, the ideas that were good, but sort of reconfigure them and not get bogged down by being having to be backwards compatible. If you look at the, the current state of OAuth 2, a lot of those RFCs are sort of fixing holes and they have to often do that in ways that um, are you know, less than ideal. Like you wouldn't necessarily go create a uh, protocol from scratch and have it turn out to be what OAuth 2 is right now. So OAuth 3 is meant to be a cleanup of all of that. And again, OAuth 3 is not the final name, who knows what it's gonna be called, but this is very much in progress right now. The, the group at the ITF is called GNAP, I think the G is supposed to be pronounced. I keep forgetting how that landed. They were, that was one of the very long mailing list threads. This is a very active discussion going on right now. Um, and uh, it, this is a good time to chime in if you have any interest in this as well. So with that, I want to thank you all for listening. And you can find more information at OAuth.WTF. My website is AaronPK.com. And I'm happy to answer any questions we have. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Aaron, very much. We do have a couple of questions here. Hopefully you can see those on the chat window. Maybe the, the first one, um, and I'm interested in this too, um, in the, the rich authorization request, maybe talk about a man in the middle attack. And I would actually, just to extend on this, I'd love to understand if there's maybe um, some guardrails or you know how people should think about using the rich authorization request. I agree that the need for better fine grade controls is great. So how should people think about using this? Yeah, so the idea with rich authorization requests is that, yeah, we're trying to describe you know detailed requests of, of dollar amounts or things like that. And yeah, there's definitely an opportunity there for bad actors to change dollar amounts or change bank account numbers. So one of the things that it does is it builds on some of those other those other works like pushed authorization requests, which means that that data about the request actually never makes it into the user's browser. It's all done on the back end, or it's um, signed as a JSON web token. 
so that you end up creating a JSON web token plus all the rich author authorization request vocabulary. So RAR ends up um, sort of describing the vocabulary or the or rather the syntax for how you describe that request, not the transport mechanism of that request. That makes a lot of sense for sure. Um, I, I love this controversial question that just came in. In your opinion, Aaron, do we need OAuth three? That is a that is a good question. Um, OAuth two, like it's not going away even after OAuth three or whatever that ends up being is a thing. OAuth two is not going anywhere. Uh, it's so widely deployed and it does work fine. Um, I would say that uh, there are some things about OAuth two that end up being. Um, well, so one example is there's nothing about identity in OAuth 2, right? OAuth, OAuth 2 says nothing about users or identities. It's always just about accessing APIs. So you need to add in OpenID Connect in order to do that. So one of the things that OAuth 3 might do is make it a lot easier to just sort of have identity baked in from the beginning, which, you know, you can solve it without that. You can solve it in OAuth 2. It just might be a little bit more complicated or more things to learn. So I think that if everything goes well, OAuth 3 will end up being a lot easier for people to start and engage with and use. Um, and maybe OAuth 2 will end up looking the way that SAML does now of like, it's sort of the complicated way that we can't get rid of because it's so widely deployed. So kind of a hand wavy answer, but I hope that's <laughs> That's fair. Um, I, uh, I think then one of the other questions here around best practice, what's um, best practice secure ways to call an API from console for token generation is there's no user login like in the browser. Do you understand that? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways to answer this. If you are um, in a console and if there is a user involved in like setting that up, you do have a user involved in the flow and you should involve them and you should not be copying and pasting API keys around. And in order to accomplish that, you can either use the authorization code flow or the device flow, which is another extension I didn't mention, um, in order to actually establish that access token in that console app. Now, if you don't have a user involved and you sort of have machine-to-machine -machine accounts, the client credentials flow is what that's for. And that's actually been part of OAuth 2 since the very beginning as well. Um, and that's really what you use when there literally is no user, where, where the app is not acting on behalf of the user. <clears throat> Right. Um, okay, and maybe one final question then. Best practices for implementing OAuth 2 server via gRPC? Nice tie back to our first session. I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that because I had zero <laughs> idea what gRPC is. <laughs> well, well, we'll park that one then um, okay. and, uh, and come back to it. Um, the... Uh, yeah, I think this this probably covers most of most of the question. Unless you see something else on that list that you'd like to to pick up on. Um, yeah, I'll talk about OIDC briefly. Um, so I, I didn't mention that in the talk at all because OIDC OpenID Connect is actually a completely separate working group from the OAuth group, and they have their own process and their own separate schedule and other extensions. Um, but that is a very they're very often used together because OpenID Connect adds in the identity part, which OAuth does not say anything about. So they're very often used together, and um, that is how the app will learn about the user. It's also, unfortunately, very easy to sort of misuse it and kind of uh, not quite understand how the two relate, which is one of the you know very often things people get confused about, which is what I try to help people understand, um, especially when access tokens are JSON web tokens, because then your access tokens and ID tokens look the same. Um, anyway, OpenID Connect is very much part of the ecosystem though, and um, it'll also very likely be part of the OAuth 3 ecosystem in some way as well. <clears throat> yeah, awesome. Uh, well, thanks uh, for that, Aaron. I really appreciate it. This was a great talk, great summary of uh, the state of, uh, of OAuth for sure. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you. Um,